It has taken me 30 hours to get to the Karkish Mountains. They are approximately 2,500 meters above sea level, and this is where the elusive blue morpho, also called Morpho Silkowski, is found. In order to find them, you have to climb and trek through dense jungle, making your own cut lines to get, a, get to a ledge where you can actually wave a flag to be able to attract them to come down to you. The mountain is steep, and it takes quite a bit of balance to be able to catch them as well as to not fall off the edge. In Peru, this is one of the few places where this very rare and highly sought after butterfly can be found. And in order to be able to catch it, you have to use a mechanism to lure it down to you. And it turns out that the males are attracted to other colors that are similar to it. So we have flags that resemble the wings of their colors and they will come down and then with a short net we try to net them. As one can see from this, it is extraordinarily difficult to be able to catch them. The catch rate is less than 1% of what we see and we don't see very many of them in the even though we are here at the peak season of them to be flying. And when we are lucky enough to actually catch one, there is a high damage rate because these butterflies fly in the trees and they don't care where their wings are rubbing against or the birds will try to peck at them because they don't have any defenses against that. So there will often be beak marks in the wings and they will be imperfect. So what we are doing is trying to catch them and keep them alive so that we can use them as breeding stock for what we are about to show you next. We carefully place the specimen into an envelope so that it cannot damage its wings or exert too much strength. And we fold up the envelope so that it cannot escape. And now we're going to bring it back into the hut where we're going to be using yeah. it to breed with the other females. The size difference absolutely huge. So, you, as you can see, it takes a long time. So, this is uh, five months old on the left hand side. And now when we compare five months. Seven months, pre pupae. See, see. Pre pupae, seven months. And then here, 
What do you have? Seven months. So this is seven Eight. months seven here. Months. And six, then seven. This is sorry, six months. And then what we have here Eight is months. Pre, pre pupa. And then eight months. At, at the, eight, eight months. At eight, eight months. Pupae. It's going to take it that long for it to get into the pupal stage. So it's a very, very long process for us to get the larva to pupate. And then from that stage, it's only 70% uh, successful in reaching adulthood. So when we're looking only at the pupa, it takes 45 days for the butterfly to metamorphosize, to become an adult. So the amount of time it takes is an entire year plus more for an adult to reach. So it's a, a seasonal variety that comes out only at certain times. Month of February is its peak. So here we have a female that has freshly emerged and she's uh, drying her wings. This female has very little blue form on it and uh, she's going to be used to breed more with the nails that they had caught earlier so that they have rich new genetic profile because there's over 3,000 larvae in here and uh, that way they have maximum strength in producing the most amount of vital adults for future generations. So once they've hatched on a piece of leaf, uh, they pin it to a fresh leaf that's actually planted in the ground. That way, when the caterpillars are ready to start feeding, they move on to the fresh leaf, and then they can remove the old dead leaf. So he's got quite a few. We have a look here. There's a ton of them. And then if we look further up, even more. And then even further up, even more. Muda. Larva 1, larva 2, ya. Cambio. Cambio, Cambio de piel. Cambio de piel. Cambio de cabeza. Okay. Change piel. Right, you can see that there's a change happening. This is actually the change of the instars. Right, that's how you can see the brown going into the more striped. That's how you know it's going from young to old. They have to change their skin every time they grow. So they have to change their skin between five to seven times. So you can see that this caterpillar here is pre pupa. In a week, it's going to turn into a pupa. And here's a. Right there. So this is one that has not been uh, managed by the breeder. He's just found it accidentally here in the in the hut. Okay. Okay, so here we have the actual place where all the pupa are hanging from the ceiling in a dark room. And you can see the Sulkowskis that are emerging, the males and the females. They're taking their time. And as they're ready to take their first flight, then the ones that are in perfect condition are going to be kept. And the ones that are so amazing to see all of these thousands and thousands of pupa that are just ready to have to right now. So here we have an absolute rarity. This one here, 10% of the population is the yellow form for the female. It lacks any type of iridescence in blue. Very, very seldomly seen. 
and we're so lucky to be able to have this example represented because he's breeding such a huge quantity that we get to see this representation. I'm not going to disturb her to open up the wings for you to see because uh, she's still inflating those. Here we have a female who's getting ready to take her first flight. What an amazing, amazing thing to witness. And you can see the colors, just absolutely magical. So you can see that she's emitting some fluids from her abdomen. that she did not use to inflate her wings and then she will become lighter and then more ready to take a flight. It won't be so difficult to fly with all that excess weight. So she'll continue to emit those fluids that she didn't need. Uh -huh. So here we have a situation where this male has emerged and is having the hardest time and it's actually defective. It's not been able to inflate its wings and uh, it's going to die because it's expending way too much energy trying to get the rest of its body out of the chrysalis and uh, it, time has run its course for it to be able to inflate its wings. Its wings are now hard and it'll never be able to fly. So that's the end for this guy. So what we have here is uh, the morpho male that has been injected with the alcohol. And you can see um, the alcohol has not penetrated the wings. It hasn't discolored it in any way. And now it's ready for papering. But before we paper it, the abdomen has to be removed, otherwise the oils from the abdomen will seep onto the wings after death. So we have to make sure that it's going to look absolutely perfect. And that's why we have the standard removing the abdomen. Okay, here's the yellow form. But there's absolutely no blue in the yellow form. It's stunning. Before the males and the females are ready to take their first flight, they are euthanized with alcohol to prevent them from damaging their wings and this is the point at which we begin to paper them. Before we paper them, the ab abdomens will have to be removed and then once the abdomens are removed, then it will be dehydrated in the paper envelope. As you can see, great care is taken in every step in handling them so that there's no damage that occurs to the specimens. Here we have an example of a deformed one. It didn't uh, come out properly. And so there's no, nothing that can be done with this. So it, it's, life is not gonna be able to continue. Quanto per cento di formenti? Quanto per cento di di malavoranza? Casi, casi. Meno del uno per cento. One per cento. Oh, only one per cento. Meno, sai. Less than one per cento. That's not bad. Che se va bene, se libera sta. So he's going to let it go and let its life uh, be whatever it can be out in nature. Here's another example of a deformity. It's total mutation. It's a um, mutation because it's been unable to take its fluids and put it into its wings in a timely manner. So it dried prematurely. Thank you.
So they're going to be taking this male and the female, sorry, the males that we caught earlier and this female, and they're going to manually pair them together to begin the next generation. As I'm speaking here, I'm getting uh, sprayed on by the abdominal fluid of one of these guys and getting wet. Time for us to go leave and uh, see how we can pair them. What we are about to do here is uh, begin um, manually pairing the males that they had caught earlier with the females that had just been emerged and they were selecting the females based on the coloration and now here's the live male that they had and now we're going to manually see them getting paired spreading the crossbows getting the female Looks like they've watched. So once the once they've completely secured themselves to each other, he's gonna set them onto a branch for them to uh, mate in peace. So he's got the female on the right, male is on the left. They're going to be getting the abdomen spread. Huh? Now they latch. Yes, sir. Um, 30 seconds, no, 15 seconds. One more. Not much there, eh? Okay. Both sides are Don't Sometimes the manual pairing does not work and the male or the female may not be interested and we'll have to substitute them. In this example we can see the male is just not interested in matching. No matter how much we're rubbing against the female, his genitals, he's just not into it. This is the reason why they collect so many wild males in order to be able to get the proper amount of selection so that they can get viable pairings happening so they don't run into these situations where they cannot get viable um, latchings to occur. And this is how they continue the breeding operation. Use a different male to do it. That male just wasn't interested. This is the result. Let's see if this male is interested in Melissa Samara. Consigo Trerica. It takes some effort and you can see here he's working his magic by rubbing the female and hopefully this male is going to take interest and begin doing what he's biologically programmed to do. Let's have a look and yeah, it's getting getting to look like there's going to be some success here. Mm 
Okay. He got it to latch. Swinton. Look at that. Swinton. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when you have successful pairings, they will remain paired up for up to 24 hours. And that's good because that's when all the um, activity can like this. give the greatest no. chance Many for hours. egg fertilization. Mm -hmm. If they detach in less than three hours, then there isn't a good chance for the female to produce viable eggs. So we'll have to observe and see yes. what the outcome is going to be. It looks very promising now. about what this all means. This conversation has to be about conservation, about preservation, about the environment, about the ecology. So how do we address it? What I've shown you here is an incredible journey of what a small family can do and make a huge impact on a population that has tremendous pressures from global forces that want to have as many specimens as possible. Their breeding program is responsible for supplying the greatest quantity of Morphosilkowski for the global demand. When you have that kind of demand on such a uh, species, you actually have uh, downward pressure to, that's going to impact the population. But when they're doing this kind of breeding, it makes it sustainable. So the sustainability part is that this entire area that the family owns the land on, they're motivated to conserve it. They're motivated to have this land produce for them what they're breeding. So the forest all around them is untouched for years. And then you have the uh, environment that has been conserved. The people are living off of the land. The uh, entire operation is, is run off of solar because electricity to be running out here in the middle of nowhere is very expensive. So this entire operation uh, results in a green footprint where I can feel confident that when I'm selling these butterflies to the global market that I'm actually putting a positive dent on uh, not just the industry but Giving, giving back to the environment, giving back to the people. The families are supported, they're motivated, and uh, the environment is now having a special boost to it. So when you buy my butterflies, you need to understand that the families that we support by buying their crop of what they grow, it's exactly how we do it sustainably from egg all the way to the finished product. 50% of all of the uh, cost for the unmounted specimens that we uh, charge for people who buy the unmounted specimens, 
50% of that comes back to the families here. It's a significant amount when you think about the other industries and what kinds of margins are out there. I just want you guys to have that clear understanding of how this industry works and what we're doing to make it so that it works for every single organism that is impacted by this operation.